In an old Alfred Hitchcock Presents show, there was a story about a woman who was in prison, and she became friends with the caretaker of the prison. The caretaker's job was very simple. Every time someone died, the caretaker would go up and ring the bell. Then the caretaker would nail the coffin close, put it on a wagon, take the wagon out into the field, and then bury the body. Since this woman in prison became friends with the caretaker, she had an idea of how she could escape. So she told the caretaker, the next time the bell rings, I will hide in the coffin with the corpse, you nail it shut as you always do, take me out into the midst of the field and bury me there. I will have plenty of air. So that way in the middle of the night you can come, open up the coffin, and I will be free. And that's exactly what happened one month later. The bell rang, and the woman knew that this was her chance. She went and she found the coffin, and before she could really even look inside or even notice her surroundings, she jumped in because she heard someone coming down the hallway, and she didn't know who it was. Fortunately, it must have been the caretaker. Didn't notice anything, just nailed it completely shut, as they talked about. Put her in the wagon, they went into the field, and sure enough, she heard the dirt being piled on top of her, and when it was completely silent, she just cried out, happy, excited, because now she was finally free. We all yearn to be free, don't we? But for this woman, it was a false sense of freedom. She was curious. Who was it that she was buried next to? You know where this is going, right? She lit a match, and sure enough, it was the face of the one who was supposed to free her. And in a typical Alfred Hitchcock fashion, the woman screams. She screams, she wails, and then it was completely silent. End of the program. Now, we have never been buried like that. But we have been buried. Maybe buried in questions. God, why? How long am I going to have to suffer? Is this really necessary? Maybe we've been buried in disappointment. You're fired. I'm sorry, but we can't work together anymore. This marriage is over. Perhaps you've been buried in the past, thinking of that one minute, that one moment when you lost your temper. Maybe you're thinking of that one day when you lost control. Or perhaps you're thinking of those many years in which you were buried, lost in your priorities. But we have all been buried in something, and when we are buried, it is suffocating. It's as if we are boxed in. It's as if we cannot escape. There is no way out. There is longing on our faces. And even if we don't scream, we certainly feel like wailing inside. And there most certainly are moments of dreadful silence. Amos today is envisioning a time in which the temple, God's dwelling place, is going to be there along with his people. In fact, it starts off with the words, I saw the Lord. When you first hear those words, you can't help but think of who the Lord is. The one who is the creator of the heavens and the earth. The one who knows all things. The one who is always with the people of God, no matter what. And in fact, Amos is going to say that later on in his vision, talking about how God is almighty and is all-powerful. However, the time is coming where this almighty, all-powerful God, his presence will be coming. 
but it's not going to be in a positive way. The people as they hear this prophet probably aren't thinking much of it. I mean, things are going well. Jeroboam is leading them in the right direction. They are experiencing economic growth like they've never experienced before. The military is strong and mighty. They have nothing to be afraid of. So what in the world is he talking about? Well, the earthquake that he mentions in the very first chapter of the book, the one that started us off on Ash Wednesday, is finally catching up. And where's it coming? It's coming on the temple. In fact, it's going to impact the very altar where they sacrifice to God. It's all going to be destroyed. And the people are going to laugh, wondering, crying out, what are we to do now? Where are we to bring our sacrifices? How can we be sure that we are still right with God? How can we be made right with God? And the result of all of this will be dead silence. And then the end he gives up. That phrase a little bit. As you know, the judgment is coming upon Israel. So much that there is nowhere they can go that God won't find them. Whether you're up in heaven, God will bring you down, or whether you're in the deep pit of death and shoal, God will bring you up. And even if you are cast into the deep of the sea, God will send a serpent and strike you, or if you are sent in exile from an army, he will send the sword to finish you off. God promises he is coming to the nation of Israel. And when God Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth, is coming after you, you are in a hopeless situation. And that's exactly what happened. 722 B.C. <coughs> Samaria comes to an end. The temple is burned. The walls crumble. Everything is turned to ashes. To that. Radio commentator Paul Hardy told of an experiment. Some scientists took a chimpanzee and were trying to teach it how to communicate using symbols. They were trying to relate the meaning of the symbols to the, the chimpanzee so that way he could then communicate back and form words and eventually form sentences. They put a lot of money into this project. The government is going for spending money well. <laughs> put all this money into a 14-year project. Finally, the time came. They believed that this chimpanzee was finally going to form a sentence. They all gathered together into this tight little room and to look over the shoulder as he starts to put the symbols together and he came up with a three-word sentence. The sentence was, let me out. Tired of being enslaved. Tired of being in captivity. Tired of being buried. Can't you relate to that? Just a little bit. We see the condemnation that is coming on Israel in this letter, in this prophecy, and we can't help but cry out because we know the very same sins that condemn Israel condemn you and me as well. We are selfish. We worship idols. There are things of the world that we would rather chase after than the God of heaven and earth, the one who created the universe and everything in it. Yet we can't help but continue to come back to ourselves and worship who we are, as if we could obtain everything for ourselves. And tonight especially, it makes it rather difficult. We just heard some wonderful hymns from Advent. Do you remember the joy we had in Advent? Uh, anticipation of the one who is coming. And then we sang that wonderful Christmas hymn, and the joy of the Christ child, the pure child. And then we had an epiphany hymn. And we can't help but remember how Christ was revealed to us as 
that the one who is shining forever. But it doesn't really carry the same name today, does it? There wasn't that same enthusiasm. Because we know on this night, the reason why it is so dark is because of us. And if you're like me, when you come in and you see black and emptiness, you almost want to cry out, let me out. However, there is a refuge. There is another temple that would also be toppled and destroyed by the plan of God. And we know on this night that this temple goes by the name of Jesus Christ. In fact, he once promised, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it. And destroy it, they did. In fact, God used all kinds of avenues to make sure it would happen. He used Judas, he used Herod, he used Pilate, he used nails, he used a flog, he used thorns, he used the spears, he used blood and sweat and everything else you could think of. And sure enough, he was destroyed. He cried out, Father, forgive them. He cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He cried out and there was silence. Crucified, dead, buried. Smell the mildew, the odor of blood, the stench of death, the sealed stone. You probably miss it if it was written in the beginning of Amos. Or in the middle. But it's not. It's written at the very end. The end of the destruction. God says, I will raise up the fallen tabernacle of David. I will repair their breaches and his ruins. I will raise it up. I will rebuild it as in days of old. But how does that help us? You and me, right now. I have an idea. Let us light a match and see who we are buried with. Romans 6 says, We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. As Colossians 2 says, that we were buried with him in baptism and raised with him through faith in the power of God who raised him from the dead. We were buried with him. We are buried with him. And it seems like our fortunes have changed. No longer is it in condemnation. No longer are we fearing God's wrath, trying to hide from Him, but we now understand that there's no place we can go to where God's grace will not reach out to us. Whether it's as high as the heavens, or into the deep, dark depths of Shoal, or into the deep river, or as high as the mountains and the hills, or as low as the valleys, we know there is not a place on this earth we can go where God's grace and mercy will not reach out to each and every one of us. Even in the midst of death, 
we know we are buried with Christ. Because our God has a way of busting out of tombs. You don't believe it. Just come Sunday. 